Who is ready for some world of antiquity? Hey everybody, how's it going? Can you hear me okay? I always want to put on my glasses, you know, because that's, that's kind of my look, but it's hard to read the screen. This is for nearsightedness, so, <laughs> so I guess I have to keep them off. Met Metastatic Milady, how's it going? Glenn, good to see you. Um, let's see, how many people do we have on here so far? We've got 16 viewers. Hopefully we'll get some more. But thank you all for joining me. Jack, you've been waiting anxiously. Oh, -ho. well, I'm hoping that uh, you'll like it. I have some good stuff in store for you today. The first half hour, as usual, I'm going to set aside for just me and you chatting uh, answering any questions you may have. Um, so lay them on me if you have anything. Of course, we love Super Chats. Super Chats get all the attention. Um, and that's just how we raise money for the channel, of course. But um, but I will try to you know see, read as many comments as I can. It's very difficult to see everybody's or and certainly to respond to everybody's. And then once we get Rob, uh, Bob Schneiker on, um, I'm going to be asking him questions, so I won't be able to see everything of yours, but I'll, I'll make sure to at least uh, catch the Super Chats. Um, well, good to see you, um, Neil, Squish, William, the Egyptian feeling, I feel that too, Izzy Ruse, Easy A, Kenny, uh, another William, William Toll, love your content, been binging it for the last few weeks, oh, I, that makes me happy. I wonder sometimes if you get too much of me, if it becomes annoying, you know. How did the mud flood start? <laughs> hey, you know what? That's going to be a question for Bob. He would know more about... Uh, well, of course, yeah, I don't know if he does. He doesn't do that time period, maybe, but he knows about geology, see. Hello from Bulgaria. Hi, Boris. Looking forward to the Sphinx discussion. Excellent. Anton, hyped for this one? Me too. Ronnie... Hi, Dr. Miano. Looking forward to the talk. Thanks, Ronnie. Hey there, Dr. Spock. Ellie, good to see you. I see we get some of our regulars here. Johnny G. Quick explanation on why Egyptian dynasties changed. Inbreeding, war, power, struggles. Thank you. Uh, here's the thing about the dynasties of Egypt, okay? <laughs> um, they're not like our dynasties. Like, when we think of a dynasty, we think of a family. Oh, the Tudors, or, you know, whatever. We think of a family dynasty. And... Sometimes that is the case in Egypt, but not always. Uh, we have found it's a little tricky. Um, and the reason why we have these dynasties is because there was an ancient Egyptian historian by the name of Manetho, Manetho, some people say. My teacher always said Manetho, but now I'm seeing Manetho may be the right way to say it. But anyway, he lived in the third century BCE, and he wrote a history of all the dynasties of Egypt and we just took those dynasties and used them. He, uh, we don't know where he got it from, okay? But it was convenient to just say, okay, we'll use Manetho's dynasties, and that's kind of how we have them. But you should know that sometimes one family will cross a dynasty. Sometimes there'll be more than one family in one dynasty. So it's a bit tricky, yeah. Uh, Brianne, do you believe the pyramids were built 4,500 years ago? Uh, yes, I do. I actually did a video. I don't know if you caught it. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Brian. I said Brian. <laughs> Brian. Brian. Yes, there's a video I did on dating the Great Pyramid. Check it out, and it'll tell you uh, kind of what I think about when the pyramid uh, is to be dated. Yes. Um, only too much Disney content is annoying. Oh, oh I can understand that. Uh, Shockley and Chuck Heston wrong about the Sphinx? Oh, Selena, you're going to find out in a few minutes. Steven, from 16 to 77, watching in seconds. Uh, oh, that's how many viewers we've got? Good, good, good. Yes. Flint, good afternoon, Chatsters and knowledgeable people. Uh, yes, and I wish you all a good afternoon as well. It's almost afternoon here. Uh, aliens were fly flying past the Earth and just decided to land and build the Sphinx and Pyramids for no reason. <laughs> Uh, there are probably some people who actually believe that. Maibel, what, what do you think of the Mount Ebal curse tablet? 
Oh, it's been some time since I've seen it. Uh, you're gonna have to remind me, my ball, what what's in it? I forgot. Um, Squish, do you have any history about the South of South America? There seems to be not too much info on their history. You know, um, I don't know if there's any. Well, I'm sure there are material remains down there, but I, I, I'm not familiar with anything. It's something I'll have to. I'd have to look up. Um. Manetho sounds pretty Greek. Yes, it, that is. Um, we get we get him through the Greeks. We we have a Greek. Well, actually, he wrote it in Greek because at, at the time Greek was the lingua franca uh, of that area. Uh, what was his actual name? Don't know, but I do know that he was an Egyptian priest. Uh, but yeah, that's a Hellenized form of his name. Maybe we could figure out the Egyptian uh, version of that, but I just don't know off the top of my head. Where's the Hall of Records? Wink. <laughs> well. I doubt there was one. It'd be great if there was, you know. I, well, let's put it this way. There was a Hall of Records, I'm sure, but I just don't think it was under the Sphinx. Um, Jay, many videos exist. One problem mentioned is past renovations of the Sphinx, making dating difficult. Another is the disproportionate head. We're going to talk about both of those things coming up, Jay, so stay tuned. Okay. Anything about the Sphinx, I'm going to stay, should save for later, all right, when Bob gets here. Um... The true builders of the Sphinx were the friends we were the friends we made along the way. <laughs> uh, Catman, hello from Tucson, Arizona. Hello, I've been through there a couple of times. I've got through the Hawar Labyrinth topic in my channel, and I've got to talk to Louis de Cordier. Oh, I sure would not invest effort to discover it. Uh, I would love to talk to Louis de Cordier myself. Um, anyway, I'd love to hear more about that Egyptian feeling. Um, but uh, you saw my video on that, right? I think uh, you must have, right? Um, anyway, uh, great topic. Um, SF Jarhead, glad I would make the live for for a while. We'll watch the record. Oh, okay. So you can't you can't stay Jarhead. That's okay. Um, my ball, earliest Hebrew name of God. Um, well, I mean, technically, there's just. There's one, and then there's some. A sh there's a shortened form of it. I, I shouldn't say that. There's all kinds of epithets for the God of the Hebrews, uh, but of course Yahweh is the the main name, um, which goes way, 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 way back. Uh, we even have it in Egyptian records. Uh, not uh, well. I have to be careful about that. We have the name in Egyptian records, but it doesn't refer to the God. It refers to a place, perhaps named after the God or something like that. Um, I live in Glastonbury. Would you consider doing a deep dive on the legends and myths around here anytime? Uh, check out, Flint, my video on the Zodiac. I did something on Glastonbury in that video. Oh, yes. Do current Egyptians feel that ancient Egypt is part of their history, or was much of the landmarks destroyed like in the Americas? Um, I th the impression I get is that the Egyptians of today see themselves as the descendants of the ancient Egyptians. Now, there are people who say, oh, no, 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 they're, they're, they're not... Uh, but um, in fact, you know, even with regard to um, invasions of other cultures into Egypt and taking control of it, which happened many times by many different empires, the, the bulk of the people stayed there and lived under the new rule. Now, yes, there was some, there was some intermingling and intermarriages and all of that, but generally speaking, the people who live there have been there the whole time. Um, so they are, in many ways, descendants of the ancient Egyptians. Um, let's see. Hello from Brazil. Hi, Silvio. Uh, Ellie, I've heard Marinite or Marinite as a possible name for Manitho, meaning beloved of Neat. Uh, that could be Ellie, but I thought Marinite was a woman's name. Uh, I could be wrong on that. I'll have to double check. Um, love your work. Does the Ark of the Covenant really melt Nazis' faces? <laughs> We haven't tested that. We have to do some experimental archaeology to see if that works. But, uh, yeah. Um, hello from Australia. Good to see you. We got people from all around the world here. That's exciting. Are we sure Meanies and Narmer are the same person? Are we sure he was this first pharaoh? Uh, no, we're not sure. So, but, but whatever the case, uh, there was an armor. We know that. Menes, or sometimes we call him uh, Meni, Meni is the Egyptian name, Menes is the Greek form, 
We think he existed too. We're not as clear on that. But whether he was Narmer or the next guy, I think it was Horaha, uh, there's some debate about that. So, yeah. Western New York. Well, I'm from Western New York, Aaron, and I'm uh, very happy to see a fellow Western New Yorker. Um, Hebrew, don't say... Yeah, yes, I know. I, I, I About the Hebrew name for God, some, some people... Um, might have been offended that I pronounced it because um, among uh, uh, certain uh, groups of Jews, it is still considered uh, sacrilegious to say it. Um, but as a scholar, you know, I got to tell you what's on in the documents, what it says. Okay, so I say it. Well, I apologize about that. Um, any thoughts on the use of archaeoastronomy in dating structures? I think archaeoastronomy can be used to date structures. I just think that people play a little bit free and loose with archaeoastronomy and uh, draw far-reaching conclusions without a lot of evidence. As the fact of the matter is, there are different conjunctions that you can line up with, and there's a lot of a lot of leeway. You know, oh, it fits this or it fits that. You know, and it's hard to narrow it down sometimes. My favorite movie. Well, it changes. Uh, but for this channel, <laughs> let's say it's Raiders of the Lost Ark, okay? Yes, I like that movie. Um, the TikTok response vids are hilarious. Thank you. Uh, some people don't like them, and they're like, why can't you be a serious historian, and why do you have to uh, pick on the kids? You know. So I don't know, but I do know that they get a lot of views. <laughs> so, I'm so I'm so tempted to keep making more because people are watching them. But then people say, tell me it's unprofessional. So what are your thoughts on that? I don't know. Um, I read a lot about what medieval Muslims thought about the pyramids, but what about the Sphinx? Was it antediluvian according to them? I don't know a lot about the Muslim legends because it comes from past ancient times. That's the thing. Okay, these are going. They're, they're coming fast and hard now. Um, uh, Aaron, you're from Rochester. Oh, inter Central New York, I am no one. Hi, good to see you. Um... Let's see. If the ark was made of wood components, would anything realistic be, realistically be left? Well, it was inlaid, uh, overlaid with gold, so that might have, but probably it would have been melted down, you know. Especially if it was stolen by another invading army or something like that, which is very likely. Uh, they might have, you know, melted it down, reused it. I, I honestly think, and I'm always the guy who's always poo-pooing everybody, but I honestly think it probably is gone, you know. Um... Hard to use archaeoastronomy when some things have been moved around. True, very true. Could the pre-dynastic Egyptian rulers uh, named for animals, like the Scorpion King, be the origins of some of the Egyptian gods? Oh, uh, Kenny, you know that's not a bad idea. Because um, we know there are many gods for, uh, from later times, right? That uh, Although there isn't... Is there a Scorpion god? There probably is. He isn't one of the main ones. But um, some people just think that uh, maybe they worshipped animals to begin with, and then, as gods be often do, they become more anthropomorphic over time, and then they take on human qualities. But others think that maybe the gods started out as part human, part animal. So it's, it's anyone's guess because it's in a time before writing, you know. Or a time w for which we don't have a lot of writing. Um, pick on the kids. They need it. <laughs> well, I do make sure that when I do the shorts, I... I do the shorts that from channels that have a lot of followers, as many followers or more than me, so I still feel like I'm not punching down, you know? Um, calling out misinformation in any form is a must. Never stop making those, okay? I love your TikToks. Definitely don't stop the TikTok vid. <laughs> Malay Hi from Malaysia. Hey, good to see ya. This is Mirol. Good to see ya. Malaysia, all right. Um, where did the Pyramidian of the Great Pyramid go? Or is it possible they never never finished it? I think they would have finished it. Um, but that might have been one of the first things somebody stole. You know what I mean? Like, the first person that got to climb to the top of the pyramid, and they're like, I'm taking this, you know? Uh, actually, it wouldn't have been one person. They would have needed a few. <laughs> um, but, you know, we do have some pyramidians of some other pyramids uh, that survived, um, which I did a, well, I did a funny TikTok video on recently, yeah, on one of them. Uh, regarding the TikToks, 
Sure, some are easy targets, but we direly need more scientists communicating with the public. So I, I say keep them coming. You know, I'm not the only one. I've seen some actual scientists um, th that do science TikTok videos, and they make fun of some of them. And uh, so it's it's been done. It's not like I'm the first, you know. Um, Solkar, this oh that's right, Solkar, the god of healing. Yes, Ellie, you are correct. You know it all. Yes. <laughs> I forgot about Sokar. Not a main god, but still, you know, a known god. Absolutely. Uh, hello from Indiana. Good to see you, Gerald. I think you should call out falsehood in archaeology, just like they do with creationists. That's what I'm trying to do. Um, and, and uh, you know, a lot of people get confused. They think I'm an archaeologist, because I do a lot of archaeological topics. I'm a historian. I'm an ancient historian, which does, of course, have to appeal to archaeology quite a bit. Um, but I'm not an archaeologist, just so you know. Um, good evening from Cape Town. Good to see you, Year Zero. I read that the original Egyptians were shepherds and animal herders until they settled along the Nile as the desert became more prominent and rains moved to the south. Is this based in truth? Um, yeah, I think actually, well... I'm not sure about I'm not sure about the shepherds and animal herders. I do know that there were hunter gatherers that settled in Egypt too, right? Um, uh, and nomadic peoples that that will eventually settle down. Um, so, but as far as I'm specifically, oh, they're all they were all shepherds and that I am not positive about that. But I do know there is evidence of animal herding in early Egypt, uh, even before they built cities or anything like that. Are you making fun, or are they doing it to themselves? <laughs> they're just they're just pitching up that ball, and I'm hitting it right. <laughs> yeah, it's it, when you pick out a TikTok video, it's not, you can't just pick any uh, any uh, video that's wrong about something, right? It has to be something where they're saying a line that you could play with, right? Um, so you know, just someone gets up there and there's something wrong. I can't always make it funny, but I can make it funny if they're giving me a something that there's a punchline for, you know. Interesting fact, Palermo stone lists, top right corner, a king named Saka. Saka is the ancient Egyptian for Scythians, and DNA of the ancient Egypt point to the same direction. Mm, I, Diana, I'm not so sure about that one. Uh, a lot of people do this, and I'm, not just with Egypt, but all kinds of countries. They play with the names, and they're like, oh, this sounds a lot like this. And when you get a two-syllable word like that, uh, it can... You know, we could find a lot of words in a lot of different languages that sound like that. And I, I know you're saying it's in Egyptian. It means uh, Scythians. But, um, well, I'd have to double check on that. I'm not sure that that's true. But um, but sometimes there are words that have more than one meaning. And uh, I, Anyway, I have to double check on that. But I would be very skeptical uh, of that connection that early on. Uh, I don't even know if the Scythians were around at that time. Um, there's a scorpion goddess, Tabitjet, a wife of Horus. Ah, thank you, Ronnie. I know that euhemerism is something of a hazardous subject, but what about cases where the ancient people themselves argued that their gods were probably based off older kings or heroes? Uh, I don't think many cultures do that, because if you're saying that their god was once a human, then they're admitting that he's not a, you know, that they're admitting that, uh, that he wasn't always a god. Now, the Egyptians did believe that their pharaohs became gods. So they're humans that become gods. Um, so there is some of that, right? But I don't think it's very common where they're like, oh, we had these human kings and then we started worshiping them. I don't think they would have admitted to something like that. Um, I think it's more often that we're just saying that, right? We're just saying that they, oh, they based them on older heroes or kings uh, without any real without them testifying to such a thing. But, William, if you have a, any examples you want to share, I will comment on them specifically, too, if you'd like. Um, trouble with calling out science and TikTok. It takes too long, certainly for me. Oh, yeah, yeah. I have to keep those videos to one minute, and it's very difficult, you know. Dr. Mino, I know we are kind of beating you over the head with it. Keep making the TikToks. <laughs> You're providing a much-needed service counterweight to dishonest nonsense. Thank you. Do sphinxes have kittens or chickens? That's got to be a joke. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, oh, I know. Oh, I, I get what you're saying. Oh, yes, because they're part. Okay, yes, yes. A uh, good question. Good question. I think they probably have a half kitten, half chicken. Um, can Egypt become developed today if sea people were never invaded it at the first place? Yes, I think so. Uh, in fact, it was developed before the sea people got there. Um, I really like that you debunk things and set the record straight. That ancient aliens show has poisoned so many minds when it comes to antiquity. Yes. Um, Saka is the Persian term for the Scythian tribes. Ah, oh, so the, it, the plot is thickening here. Yes, and there is no relation between Persian and Egyptian language. Um, neither. They laid soft-shelled eggs, obviously. <laughs> um, what's a TikTok, and has anyone ever deciphered them? <laughs> Uh, there was an ancient Greek philosopher that thought gods and myths were based on real humans. Yes, that's Euhemerus. That's why we call it Euhemerism. Yes, Euhemerus is the name of that philosopher. Um, and his ideas are still held by some. Not me, however. Um, I mean, I'm not saying it's impossible that uh, a, a former human a hero or something could have later been deified. That is certainly possible, and we have seen it. But to just assume it is another story. Um you know, we would have to have something else besides just the possibility. If ancient Egyptians believed that pharaohs were or became gods after they died, why did so many pharaohs steal from and desecrate images of deceased pharaohs? Wouldn't they have been scared to do so? Ah, a couple of things there. First of all, they became gods while still alive. Yes. Um, now, they go to another level after death, but they were actually worshipped as gods while alive. Yes. Uh, but also worshipped other gods. It's very strange. You know, they can be a god and also be religious. Yeah, um, Desecrating the images of deceased pharaohs was a way to attack them in the afterlife. So they would desecrate those by like scratching out their name or anything like that or their face. And they believed they were harming their souls, right? Their spirits in the afterlife. And that's why they did that. Yeah. Um, th by the way, the Egyptians believe that there's lots of souls in a person, not just one. Which Egyptian gods used to be pharaohs? I don't think any of them, uh, Jarhead. Um, I don't think any of them. Oh, no, I shouldn't say that. Because all, <laughs> all pharaohs are gods, <laughs> right? But you mean the gods that we all know about, right? You, you mean the, the main gods and all of that. Um, no, but, but a pharaoh was worshipped uh, in his lifetime and after death, so he's a god. He's a god. But just not like Osiris and Horus and all of those guys, Thoth, whatever. I don't think they were ever real people. Um, oh, and thank you for the uh, super chat, Jarhead. You're the first one of the of the day. Appreciate that very much. That helps out the channel and keeps it going. Um, I'm trying to get to a point, everybody, where I can um, make better videos and pump them out faster. The longer ones, because I know a lot of you want to see more of those. Uh, by hiring people, but I can't do that without some uh, your, some of your help. So I appreciate it very much. Um, call me a bluff old traditionalist, but I still prefer to go get my historical info from books and scholars and not TikTok. You know, it's not a bad idea, Flint. Um, do we have any idea what the Egyptians called the Sphinxes? Yes. Um, oh, I'm trying to remember now. <laughs> Um, I guess I could Google it, but you could Google it too. There is a word for it, yes. Um, and it's just not in my head right now. Sorry about that. Um, oh, Diana says Egyptians also use the term Saka. Um, maybe they heard the Persians using it and, and used the same name or something like that, possibly. But the Egyptians didn't encounter Scythians until later, so this would not have been a word used early on. Um are there any pieces of Minoan writing that, from their appearance, context, might tell a story rather than being used as a text, trade records, of some other form of logistic use? Um, th there might be a little bit, but most of the stuff we have found is like business receipts and records. But I, I am certain there's probably some other kinds of information in there. There's no, we don't have any really long ones. Like that's the thing about a story. It wouldn't be a long story because we don't have any extensive. If we had longer Minoan writings, they'd be easier to decipher. So start looking for them, Kenny. We need some. Benny, thank you so much for the super chat donation. Very much appreciate it. 
Thank you. Wait, you think Thoth was not a real person? Interesting. I do not think he was a real person. I mean, uh, well, first of all, would a real person have had uh, the head of an ibis? Uh, no. <laughs> but I know what you're saying. Well, maybe he didn't originally. Well, there's no historical evidence for him. Uh, and um, I'm not saying, like, if we found historical evidence for Thoth, then I would change my mind. But at this point, I'm kind of doubtful. Yeah. Um, I, oh, oh, geez, okay. Oh, Flint, thank you very much uh, for your super chat. Is it perhaps more correct to say that the Pharaoh was thought of as a li living emanation of one of the gods? Well, he was an incarnation of Horus. Uh, would I say that's an emanation? Maybe that, that's a word you could use. But what I'm saying is he was treated as a god and worshipped as a god. And in fact, at his cr uh, crowning ceremony, he was thought to be divinized. So turned into a deity of some kind, you know. But yes, he is a manifestation uh, of Horus. Um, yeah. Um... Have you seen this channel, History for Granite? I have, and I really have enjoyed some of those videos. Lots of great information, especially about the pyramids uh, on that channel, Marcus. Um, has there been any research discoveries of any civilization in the lush jungle era of the Sahara? It seemed to end right before known Egyptian history started. Uh, well, uh, Logjam, um, not any uh, civilization, but definitely evidence of in habitation, so a uh, habitation. There were, uh, you know, Stone Age settlements. Uh, well, actually, were there settlements? There may have been settlements, or were there? Mm. They might not have been settlements, but we have evidence for it being inhabited, okay? Um, so we have that, but it was still early. It's before the time that cities were created and all that, so uh, it's very early on. Um, are the tablets of Thoth, Asclepius, and the Hermetica actually from Thoth? Uh, well, no. As far as the... Uh, there, are, There's some confusion about the tablets of Thoth, so I probably should mention this. Uh, the, there's, there's something called the Emerald Tablet of Thoth, which is a real document, but it's from medieval times. And then there's something called the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, which are made up in, by, in the 20th century, okay? Uh, the guy wrote a book about it. So don't get the two confused, okay? But neither of them are from Thoth or from uh, Hermes Trismegistus. Uh, Asclepius, um, well, it's, of course, that's a, that's a, Asclepius was associated with Thoth. And I think maybe that's what you're talking about. But there's a whole separate Greek tradition about Asclepius um, that's separate from the Egyptian stuff. But I think you may be referring to the Asclepius connection with, with the Egyptians, probably. Um, let's see. I thought the Sahara is more of a grassland than a jungle. Um, well, it depends on what part we're talking about. But there, but there was definitely green growth, lots of green growth in the Sahara uh, at one time. Thoughts on the Great Sphinx originally being a jackal? I don't think so. I, don't th I think the head is original. I really do. Um, and that it, some people say, well, it's too small. Well, that's just because it was the shape of the rock. They had to work with what they had, you know. Um, I don't think there's enough evidence to show that it was recarved. There's nothing that's been examined on it that says, oh, look, it's been recarved. There's nothing like that. It's just like, oh, it doesn't seem to fit. And that's pretty much all they have, you know. Uh, oh, it's almost time to bring in Robert. Have you seen Told in Stone? He makes interesting videos on ancient Greece and Rome. Yes, I have. I have a very good channel, very good channel. Um, all right, so we're going to bring in our guest today, okay? And I know you're going to be saying stuff in the chat, but I'm not going to be able to, of course, handle all of your questions at this time. I will pay attention to the super chats, however. And then after I talk with uh, Bob, I, I will open uh, the, the questions up to him He might about the Sphinx, and, and then you can uh, ask him things about that, okay? So I'm trying Skype today to, to bring him in. He... Um, I mean, Zoom I had last time, but it was um, uh, it was only a 40-minute time limit, so I don't... Oops, I'll turn that down a little bit. <laughs> We're calling him up right now. Let's see if he's home. There he is. Okay, let me bring you on to the main screen here. All right. Bob? Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear, uh, but All I don't right. know if they can. 
Um, I don't we... think so. I'm looking at it streaming, and I don't see it uh, on my phone. Let's. Um, I, I just got to. I'm, I'm trying to uh, um, crop you here and bring you in. Just be patient, everybody. Just a second. I'll get him in here, and let's uh, transition here. Uh, they say they can hear you, Bob. They can hear you. Excellent. Uh, you're not quite centered. Maybe that's my fault. Uh, no. I kind of am. Here. Oh, you are there. Let me let me make sure. I'm, oh yeah. Okay. Let's do this. Uh, oh, I see it. Okay. I'm gonna do that. That's better. And then I'm gonna uh, make me a little bit smaller. Okay. I'm looking down because I got my phone here, so that's why. <laughs> How is uh, Bob sound? Can you hear him all right? Sounds can you, all can right. Everybody hear me. Um, can see and hear. They say okay, excellent. Okay, we've got a geologist here on the channel. All right, a geologist, and you know, um, there is a geologist out there who uh, loves to talk about the Sphinx, and this is uh, this is the one you should be listening to. <laughs> <laughs> um. But uh, people are probably familiar with uh, Robert Schock and uh, how he's made a quite a career since the '90s of uh, about uh, talking about the age of the Sphinx, and um, it's good to get another opinion. I think um, not to uh, I mean I'm not um, um, calling into question Robert Schock's credentials as a geologist. He's a geologist, of course he is. But not all geologists um, agree on the evidence and. So uh, I did a video, you may have seen it, um, you may have seen it on the Sphinx, where I go over all, a bunch of uh, different geologists and their views on the Sphinx, including Robert Schock, and including here, Robert Schneiker. Um, and, uh, but I thought it would be great to have him come on, because I'm going to uh, ask him some more questions about it and about his, uh, his ideas, and then you can ask him some questions after I'm done asking him questions. Um, so yeah, so thank you for, for being with us here, Bob. Yeah, I want to start out by saying that the last question was about whether the Sphinx ever had a jackal head, oh, yeah. a larger head. What do you Th think that's about That's impossible. Ah, There's a it's fracture impossible. in the front and the fracture behind, and the layer from which the Sphinx was carved was never thick enough. George Reisner pointed that out back in 1942, that the top of the head basically marks the top of the uh, original, what's been called a plateau, but it's really a cuesta. So it's impossible to make a bigger head, and it has. There's no evidence that it's been recarved. So it, it, it not only was it not a jackal head, it wasn't any other kind of head. This is you're saying that this is the original head. Yeah, it's actually this the block from which the head was carved defines the 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 the, the size of the sphinx because that was a fracture free block of rock, of a given thickness and a given size. I see. Okay. Uh, well, there's a there's a mystery solved right there, um, but I don't think that uh, uh, it's geologists who talk about the, there being a, a, a different uh, head on there. It is mainly other people who say that. Um, so I think even I could be wrong, but I think even Robert Schott, or does, well, maybe he, maybe he does say there was another. Oh head yeah, he's it. a big advocate. He was saying that it was originally a lion's head. A lion's and, head. And yeah, yeah, and again, if you look at his. Uh, depictions of that there's got to be 14 meters of erosion from the back of the head to the underside of the neck on the sphinx it's not just the you know one to three meters of, of so-called erosion he, he's got 14 meters of erosion but again the layer was never thick enough to produce a larger head like that you can see it in the wadi to the south of the sphinx if you look at that that was very soft rock that was above the sphinx and the and the layer from which the Sphinx head was carved was a, a capstone that uh, it's the reason that the uh, that the pyramids are there that they picked that location for the high quality rock I see so um, I'm going to ask you a basic question here at the beginning um, can geology be used to date the Sphinx no I mean we can put some time frames on that so it's it's got to be after the african humid period so it's got to be younger than about 5500 years because if it were around prior to that it would have been eroded away completely by the nile river there, there'd be nothing left of the sphinx if it were older than 5500 years 5000 years somewhere in that neighborhood so, other than uh, that no so the nile river um 
that whole area where the Sphinx is, what would it have looked like in the humid period? Oh my goodness. Um, the, the, the flows were significantly higher. As it is now, the Nile has less flow in it than the, the Rhine River. But it's almost exactly the same length as the Amazon River. And back in the day, during the African humid period, all the wadis were active. And there was another river called Wadi Hawar, which is also known as the Yellow Nile, that came in. And so the flows were significantly higher. It basically was a, a, another Amazon at the time. I see. And so, um, and when, when is the humid period again? That's about, well, it started at 15,000 years ago, right at the end of the Ice Age. And then during the Younger Dryas, it, it probably reverted a little bit to desert for a short period of time and then started up again around, what, 13,000 years ago and ended about 5,500 years ago. It's hard to draw a line on such a large area exactly when it began and ended. And it moved from the south to the north and then came from the north back down to the south. Mm -hmm. Now, you pointed out, uh, I think, to me that um, even Randall Carlson uh, in his Joe Rogan interview said something of that sort, which contradicted uh, Robert Schock's hypothesis, right? Yeah, I mean, that's what's really funny is that people who don't really know a subject and, and they want to come up with these you know, grand conspiracy theories, they often prove themselves wrong. And, and so Carlson did that on Joe Rogan. He was saying that it was due to the overtopping of Lake Victoria that all this excess water was flowing down the Nile. That's not true at all. That water evaporates in the Sud Swamp. And so Lake Victoria and the White Nile does not contribute very much. Even during the African humid period, it was all these other sources. <clears throat> but he does accurately describe, and he also uh, ascribes it to an older date. I think it's like 20,000 to 12,000 years ago. But his statement on, the, on Joe Rogan is enough to prove John Anthony West wrong. He already proved that wrong. I, I just love the fact that he thinks he's proving the scientists and the archaeologists wrong, but he's proving John Anthony West wrong. And all you have to do is go online to look when the African humid period occurred, and you realize that he's now also proven Robert Schock wrong with his descriptions of the devastation, which is an accurate description of what would have happened uh, during the African humid period. And that would, just, that would have just obliterated the Sphinx, you think? Oh, yeah, without question. I mean, it cut the Nile. It cut the canyon that the Nile's flowing in. Oh, yeah. um, it was like an Amazon river at the time. He describes the flows as being like 100 feet higher, if I remember right. I think that further upstream, it's hard to say exactly what the flows would have been right by the Sphinx, because the area, I mean, it's, it, geologically, it's a really interesting area. The, the Nile, the city of Cairo is actually sitting on top of a canyon that's one and a quarter miles deep of all soft sediment. So as the Mediterranean Ocean goes up and down, the, the Nile River would quickly adjust to that. So during the Ice Age, the Sphinx would have been high and dry. And then as, as the ocean levels came up, the river would quickly adjust to that and flood the area. I see. So the, 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 date, the, the Sphinx must have been constructed after, from a geological point of view, after the African humid period. Without question. Mm -hmm. uh, but we can't narrow it down geologically more than that? No. Um, no. I mean, so... If the Sphinx were older, though, I mean, it, it becomes more absurd because that layer that the head marks, the top of the head marks, that would have been the original surface. So if somebody decided to carve the Sphinx prior to the pyramids being built and all that material being quarried, then the Sphinx would have been completely below grade. It would look sort of like those churches in Ethiopia that they carved out of the rock. The entire thing would have been below grade. And you have to then ask the question, I mean, you wouldn't see it until you got right on it. And then you also have to ask the question, if these people, this advanced civilization existed, why would they put the Sphinx into the floodplain? It just, not, none of it makes any sense. Uh-huh, yeah. Now, um, let's talk about the erosion on it. Uh, this is part of Robert Schock's main evidence. Uh, now, he points mostly to the Sphinx enclosure, although I do think there's some of the similar erosion on the on, on um, the back of the Sphinx or something like that, but it looks like 
uh, crevices that were made from water runoff, right? Yeah. So there's almost no erosion on the Sphinx, um, in my opinion. Everybody else who's looked at it, even, you know, the archaeologists, you know, like Mark Lehner and Hawass, I mean, Shock. When, when Shock came out and said that there was erosion on the Sphinx, that was not a, a game changer for the archaeologists, the Egyptologists. They already had assumed that that surface was an eroded surface. They just didn't know when or how that occurred. Mm -hmm. And Shock came in and said, you know, I know when that er erosion occurred. It occurred during what we now know as the African humid period. And somehow the rain, in his scenario, only falls on the Sphinx and no place else in the Sahara. Because if it, you know, like I, I pointed out, it would be underwater during the African humid period and it'd be destroyed. So uh, th thank you, Jarhead, for uh, another donation. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, by the way, uh, Bob, uh, occasionally I'm going to interrupt you when I when I get a, a super chat, which is a donation. I'll, I have to acknowledge sure. it, so uh, I might have to butt in sometimes. <laughs> no, that's fine. So, so the thing is, is that everybody assumed it was eroded, and that's and I assumed that. I looked at this thing, saying, "Well, that looks like an erosional surface," but if you look at it more carefully, you realize that what's called erosion, as I already pointed out where Shock was saying it had a lion's head and there's 14 meters of erosion, it's at the back of the neck and that has been patched with concrete. So you can't see how, how much that's been carved back. But if you look at the quality of the rock that the Sphinx was carved from, there's, there's places where it's so soft you could crumble it in your fingers. And so you, you cannot carve that into the, the Sphinx. That's impossible. So mm -hmm. that's what they did is they, they used the stone tools. They had, you know, stone, uh, they had uh, pounders, rock pounders and stone hammers, and they pounded it back and they flaked it and then covered it with high quality limestone. Yeah, and that's where you and differ from Lehner, right? Uh, he thinks that the, the, the stone um, blocks that cover the Sphinx body are from later, they're later repairs, but you think that they're original. Or at least some and, were original. And Lehner speculated on that, and others have speculated on that. And, and in his 1991 dissertation, Lehner points out that the only reason he dismissed the idea that what are called the phase one blocks date to the old kingdom at the time, you know, 4,500 years ago, is because of the erosion behind the blocks. But you're saying the erosion was original, it's like it was there erosion. already. Huh? It's not erosion. Oh, I'm sorry, not erosion. But that the, the appearance of the limestone was like that when the Egyptians started making the Sphinx. So what it was was that it's, you know, so it's carved in a quarry. Yeah. So they, they took the blocks. Well, originally the whole area was covered with blocks, I mean with limestone, to the level of the top of the, the Sphinx head, and they, cut, and they quarried that to build the Great Pyramid. And uh, then the uh, Sphinx itself... Yeah, I, uh, I'm sorry. I was anticipating what you're saying. So you're uh, you're basically saying that as they dug down, that's the way that the the Sphinx looked. I mean that, that the um, the limestone had that appearance, right? As they carved it. So it's it's a highly weathered limestone, and it was weathered by two processes. Are you there? I'm here. So it was weathered by two processes. The one which was just astounding when I saw this I thought it was I thought it was as crazy as all the, um, the alternative historians I, I, I'm pretty sure that there is an exposure of what's called a hyperthermal in the head of the Sphinx have you ever heard of those no so a hyperthermal is a global heat wave that was produced by the release of huge amounts of carbon dioxide to Earth's atmosphere when was this? Or so there were multiple ones. The biggest one occurred 56 million years ago, and it's called the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum. That one's crazy. The release of carbon dioxide is somewhere between the known fossil fuel reserves on Earth and three times the known fossil fuel reserves on Earth. And and, and I thought that was the coolest thing, and I just started reading everything I could about hyperthermals, and then I'm like, wait, I'm supposed to be working on the Sphinx, and I looked at the Sphinx, and the contact at the, at the neck 
I suddenly said, that's, that's a hyperthermal. <laughs> and it turns out that it probably is. So the, the, one of the things that happens when all this uh, carbon dioxide gets into Earth's atmosphere is the oceans become extremely acidic and they kill off a lot of marine organisms. And one of the organisms that they killed off is a, a, a formanifera called Numulites gizihensius. And so uh, when by the way, goes, uh, like, uh, I'm interrupting once again. Thank you, Robin. Thank you for your uh, Super Chat donation. Appreciate it very much. So when that goes extinct, that marks the beginning of the, that is the hyperthermal. And it's called the Middle Eocene Climatic Optimum. So the Sphinx marks this unique geologic event, a worldwide event. And hyperthermals were not discovered until 1991. And yet, here's one that's been staring us in the face for the past 4,500 years. And so it was made millions of years ago. 45, I mean, 40 million years ago, yeah. That's, so, when um, that, that's when that erosion occurred. And what it did was the acidic water dissolved the limestone. So for limestone first deposition stopped. The oceans became so acidic it dissolved the limestone. And then um, on top of that, once the, the carbon dioxide levels decreased, then this high-quality limestone of the head was being deposited um, during the, as the Miko was going away. So um, just so I understand you, so when they started quarrying there, before there was a sphinx, uh, the limestone was already in a very degraded condition, is what you're saying. Well, it depends, yes. Okay. And the other thing, yeah, and the other thing that happened to it is the acidic groundwater. So the, the Sphinx has been eroded by, uh, I'm sorry, not eroded, but weathered by acidic groundwater. And it dissolved along the fractures and it created what's called, the, the biggest thing would be the major fissure, if you're familiar with that. Yeah. So that, that was a limestone dissolution. And that occurred again over millions of years as ocean levels went up and down, as the Nile floods went up and down, as, as the African, well, the Green Sahara periods came and went. And, and, and that's like taking a piece of metal and bending it back and forth. If, it, if you just put it underwater and left it set, great. But if you take this and you dry it out and you wet it, it's, it's bending it back and forth. And that's what caused the, the limestone to weather. It's not erosion. It weathered. And yeah, could you, could you uh, for my audience, could you um, explain the difference between erosion and weathering? Because sometimes people use them interchangeably, but you told me they're completely different, right? Exactly. So the weathering occurs... Where the where the rock is is some portion of it is being dissolved and it's and it's and it's becoming softer and weaker. Erosion is actually removing that rock, so that's the the process by which it's actually removed is erosion. I see, uh, and a weathering is is uh, um, it can, can it doesn't have to is it exposed? Oh, you mean it doesn't have to be exposed to the air to be weathered, right? No, it, it, uh, in fact, a lot of the weathering occurs underground by groundwater, uh, acidic groundwater dissolving it. That's what uh, forms caves, but it also created this very soft limestone. So it's the combination of the, of the, the hyperthermal and the acidic groundwater that created rock so soft you can crumble it in your fingers. Mm -hmm. you, you, can't, you can't carve that. And I didn't even realize this, but I solved a question that I didn't even know existed which is that Lehner and others have speculated where in the world, if this repair occurred by Tutmos IV in 1400 BC, where did he get the high quality limestone blocks, the phase one blocks that are put on the Sphinx? Because by this point, that quarry has been depleted. Ah, but, they but you're saying they would have used it right from that quarry because it was original. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a super chat here from Wayne. Thank you, Wayne, for the ten dollars. Uh, he also has a question. So it possibly looked like a shaped stone monument with a carved head when it was originally finished. Is his question? Um, I think the answer to that is yes. It, yeah. So when it was, go ahead. I was going to say yeah. I mean, it was it, it when it was finished. It would have been a hybrid. So it's more like the pyramids than people think it was it the rock isn't a monolith the sphinx was carved from day one the lower sections the rear the rear paws were carved directly out of the limestone the center section was covered with blocks and the head was a, a carved directly out of the limestone again so it was a hybrid so the um 
my, my question automatically would be then, if, if the limestone was in such deteriorated condition from the weathering over millions of years, why, how, how was it usable for them to make blocks out of it and things? Oh, so the, the limestone, yeah, that's a good question. So the, the limestone of the head, because it was deposited, even as the oceans were still more acidic, that's a high quality limestone. So that's So the higher reason. in the quarry was the better limestone and lower yeah. in the quarry was the worst limestone. Well, in the middle, if, if you look oh, at the, the middle, and the lower section is good, not as good, but it's it's still a good quality. I see. Now, uh, Robert Schock points to the enclosure wall uh, and uh, show, says there's evidence for water runoff. Do you agree with that? No. So that's no, not water just... runoff. No. So what you can you can actually see what's going on there. This is how I got involved with the Sphinx. So if you watch the Nova episode with Mark Lehner. And he's talking about how groundwater is wicking up and it evaporates at the surface. And as it does, salt accumulates in the pores. That builds up pressure and the rock exfoliates. And it gives, that's erosion, and it gives that rounded appearance. And it's just following the fractures that are in the bedrock. So that has nothing to do with flow. If it's flow, you should have a plunge pool. Erosion doesn't cut back on the wall. Erosion cuts hardest on the floor where all the debris and things in the water are carving down. And then, like a waterfall, that works its way upstream. There, there are no plunge pools at the Sphinx. So you can scratch the idea that that was carved by water flowing into the Sphinx. So why does the enclosure wall look different than the Sphinx body? A, a great question. So th part of the answer is is that it's actually not a, a plateau. It's a cuesta. So it slopes down towards from the py Great Pyramid down towards the Sphinx. And so the, the southern wall of the Sphinx excavation is actually lower and closer to the water table. And so that's where the erosion is occurring from the wicking groundwater. The other reason is <clears throat> that the Sphinx has been covered with blocks. This whole thing has been modified so many times. <clears throat> so it's been protected more. Is what... I don't know if I'd say protected. It's sort of like I, I, I consider it scribbling on a masterpiece because and, and, and it hides the true story. Like when I got there, I wanted to take a photo of one of the fractures just behind the head. That's been filled in. And that's recently, in the last like 20 years or so. I'm, I don't know exactly when, but that's been filled in. So people are constantly modifying what the Sphinx looks like, and it, and, it, and it conceals the fact that it really wasn't as spectacular as it looks now because of the modern repairs that make it look like, oh, my goodness, they did that back in the time. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so then uh, just walk us through the process of the making of the Sphinx from, from, from the geological wow. clues. So... They're going to make, uh, how, did they just, how did they go about doing it, in your opinion, from the geology? They, they, they approached it like anybody would approach any construction project. The first thing they did is they put in a series of borings. And there's one of the borings is still discernible, and, that is at, and it's contained within the, the Sphinx now. But they, they, car they carved down all the way down to the water table, and they saw what the quality of the rock was like. You don't just start building something like that without designing it. And so they, they, that's the first thing they did. After they had some idea of what they were encountering, they, they discerned that they had this fracture-free block from which they carved the head. And the slope of the, the face, not only, I mean, so the, the facial features follow the bedding planes. So the, you can look at the mouth and the nose and the eyes. They follow bedding planes. And you can see if you look at the face from the side, if you look at it from the south or from the north, you'll see it slope back, and that's because that's the fracture. You can see roughly that same angle in the fracture that was filled in behind the, the sphinx. I should do it that way, I guess. But um, so what they did is they carved from the top down, and as they started carving, they had the high-quality limestone from which the head was carved. And then as they reached the softer layer, which they already knew was there, they did not know that the major fissure was there. Mm. And, and Lehner is the one who points this out, is that what they had to do then is they elongated the body 
because they found this huge gap. It's something like 10 feet wide. So that's why the body's bigger than the head. Yeah. Ah. That's no mystery. (laughs) And so they also then had to fill that gap with blocks. So the Sphinx had to have blocks from day one. Oh, okay. (laughs) So I don't... So... I don't know. Sometimes it seems like the Egyptologists, the archaeologists are like trying to make this sound more mysterious. I'm like, no, this had to be there. And, and, and the, um, you know, the alternative historians, whatever you want to call them, alternative archaeologists, they never point out those things that don't support their mm-hmm. crazy ideas. So they never bring this up. But yeah, so the Sphinx had to cover that gap. And, when they, and one of the ways in which you can tell that this happened is, is that uh, when you look at the rear paws, there is a shelf. That's not erosion. You you can't have a shelf. So the the, the 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 rear paws are here. The surface of the rear paws are here, and then there's a shelf which the blocks were stacked on. So that was carved back, and it's that shelf which is flat that goes then to the undulating surfaces. Well, if this is erosion, again, rain would have fallen on that, and that vertical, I mean, that horizontal shelf would have been eroded back. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I've got so a super better. chat here from Mr. Monster, $5. He has a question. Um, sure. He says, uh, I'm late. Have you talked about when it possibly got started under construction? Well, we were just talking about ge- geology not being able to narrow it down, but we did talk about that it had to be after the African human period. But what about this one, Bob? Um, what about rumors of a cavity underneath with treasures? Yeah. Geologically, is that possible? Um, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Shock went out there and he did refraction seismics. I've done refraction seismics. You cannot find a low velocity zone with refraction seismics. In other words, you cannot find a hall of records using that method. If he's got some way of defining that, I'd be very interested. As a, as a geophysicist, I'm more interested in that than anything he's got to say about the Sphinx. But what he did identify is, in fact, that it is a highly weathered limestone. You can tell that by the seismic velocities. It's not, it's not a competent uh, solid limestone. And so if there were a hall of records, particularly beneath the Sphinx, it would collapse <laughs> into that hole in no time because this is obviously a soft, weathered, limestone just wouldn't hold up and he yeah it wouldn't hold up so no that's that's not possible um on top of that it's below the water table the water table is is 15 meters below the surface of the sphinx so the sphinx i should make this point really clear the sphinx sits at 20 meters above sea level it is exactly as far above sea level as it's tall it's not on a plateau I don't know why everyone keeps saying that the Sphinx is on a plateau. It is in the Nile floodplain. And we know from the Nilometer that at times the, the, the Sphinx was actually flooded by the Nile. And it's only because of the Aswan Dam that periodic floods aren't coming through and at least inundating the Sphinx and Valley temples and occasionally actually filling the Sphinx excavation with water. And mm. we know that that water did not erode the Sphinx because... The, the layers of rock on the Sphinx follow bedding and they slope down. If you had water in there, it would cut right across those. The waves would cut right across those and create erosion that way. And that you don't see that. Yeah. I've got another super chat here from Flint. Thank you, Flint. Um, uh, this is probably not a geology question, but can we settle an argument? What are the theories on the loss of the nose on the Sphinx? Um, I think that's more recent, obviously, but... Um, well, it could have been done in ancient times, I suppose, but I don't know if there's if geology can answer that question. I don't know if I can answer that question. Um, Lehner um, believes that it was somebody came in there with a chisel and oh. actually chiseled off the nose, and I forgot exactly when they that do that to happened. a lot of statues. Uh, yeah, know, to, to desecrate. So he them. would. Yeah. He would. Yeah, exactly. So he would point out where the chisel marks are that that this person. Yeah, where they put the chisels and pounded the nose off. Yeah. Jason, thank you for the super chat. Much appreciated. Um, 
So the 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 uh, what I can see now that the problem that about the alternative historians, what they're focusing on, and maybe even some of the regular archaeologists, uh, is they're they're assuming that the weathering and the erosion is all occurring between the making of the Sphinx and now, but actually, it's all before the Sphinx. Well, no. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> yes. So the weathering occurred before. What is typically described as erosion, I'm saying, is part of the construction process using ancient tools. And so, you know, and they pounded it back and that created, and they flaked the rock off and that created what looks like what's. Oh, so it looks like everywhere. erosion, but it isn't erosion. Correct. Ah, okay. And, and that was and, made and at, you, during the making of the Sphinx. So you're talking about like the Sphinx was, body. Yeah. Yes. And that's where, when you look at it, if you look at these old photos, if you go to my webpage, you, you can see these. I put side by side the photos, and you can just see that there's this section right under the head, which is right where the, the hyperthermal occurred. So that rock was so soft and weathered. It was weathered by the hyperthermal. It was weathered by the acidic groundwater. You could crumble that in your fingers. They couldn't possibly create anything out of that. That rock was weathered. It was soft. It was unusable for constructing anything, for carving anything. And that's mm -hmm. why they pounded it back and then put the blocks on it. I see. Yeah. Um, they did. Go ahead. I was going to say they did something very unusual on those blocks. And, and maybe you as an Egyptologist, you know, as a, 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 could, an archaeologist could explain this. They actually took the phase one blocks and they carved them to match the undulations. And and the and the and the and as far as I as, if I remember this right, they did that on the Sphinx. They did that with with the with the coverings that they put on on the Valley Temple and the Sphinx Temple, and the Mortuary Temple, and that's it. For some reason, at the time that they were building this, that Sphinx, was just the way they did it then, huh? Yeah, and, and nobody's going to see it. Why why go through the trouble? Yeah, the, the, remember the, I realized later, like, why are we going through this extra work? Yeah. And, and they were doing that in that high-quality limestone, so that would have been difficult to do. So it also helps to date that those three, I mean, those those four things all sort of tied From the, around the same time, yeah. Shane, thank you sir, very much for the super chat. Um, and he says, thank you very, very much for taking the time to do this. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Uh, Bob, do you want to open it up to some questions about the Sphinx uh, from the sure. chat? Um, so sure. let me see if, if there are some here. Um uh, let's see. Um, uh, I'm going to go back a little bit here. Um, can I can I say one thing yes, before go ahead. I do that? Yeah, go ahead. I, I just wanted to point out that I'm not like you know Hancock and Carlson and all this. I've actually done research, so I, I wanted to point out that I, I presented a paper on the wicking water at the Sphinx and confirmed that that process was turned on when they carved the Sphinx by intersecting the capillary rise zone, and whenever the Sphinx excavation fills with sand, that, that mode of, of erosion is turned off, and it was not turned on prior to the Sphinx being carved. So that's the paper I presented in 2014 at the GSA conference in Vancouver. Then I've done the research to say that there is a middle Eocene climatic optimum, that the hyperthermal in the head of the Sphinx, and that's what part of the reason so there's an unconformity and then explains why the high quality limestone is in the head and the poor quality below and then i explained <clears throat> that the sphinx was actually created carved as a hybrid that it was covered with blocks from the beginning that that's not erosion and the final thing i did was there's actually a mystery the, the, there's a dewatering system that was put in by the sphinx because of this wicking water and for some strange reason, that water table has been rising, and nobody can figure out why. They suggested it was sewers, but if it was sewers that were leaking, then you would have nitrates. And so they said, well, it's the water supply system. I came to the conclusion that, no, it's because they took what was farmland until recently, and they paved it over, put houses on it, put streets on it, sidewalks and such. And so the water can't evaporate, and it's got no place to go but up. Oh, and then I looked that's... at how because now there's this dewatering system and they just chose arbitrarily to draw the water table down 
to where it used to be, and I'm not sure that that's drawn down far enough to stop the wicking erosion of the Sphinx. Oh, that's so that's not good. Um, it's borderline. I, you okay. know, I, I, I'm using some assumptions, and I, I'd say it's 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 right there. Mm-hmm. I can't I can't say for sure either way, but it is something that when they designed that system, they they didn't they didn't look at that. Okay, here's a question. Um, was there a known period when that area, I think around the Sphinx, didn't flood? Um, oh yeah. So there would be times when, like I was saying. So what happened about six million years ago is the Mediterranean got cut off from the Atlantic. And when it did, the Medi- in about a thousand years or so, the Mediterranean completely dried up. It evaporated. All the rivers that feed the Mediterranean cannot keep up with evaporation. And what happened at the Nile and all these other rivers, too, it cut canyons. So at that's what I was saying earlier. So the city of Cairo is sitting on top of a Grand Canyon that's 25% deeper and five times longer than the Grand Canyon. So it's all this soft sediment there. So if, as ocean levels go down during ice ages and all that water is trapped at the poles, the Nile would quickly adjust to that. And it would expose, and the Sphinx you know, might have been like 400 feet above the Nile. And then other times like now, when the ocean levels have come up, it's going to fill with river sediment like a delta very quickly and adjust. So that that area will. So there definitely were times when the the area where the Sphinx is periodically would be dry. That's why I said it's like bending that piece of metal back and forth. Oh yeah. Uh, someone says, any chance that it is early dynastic? Um, I don't know if geology can answer that, but you you did mention that um, the blocks uh, seem to be similar on the uh, other constructions of the old kingdom, right? And and also you said that um, this is the a quarry that was used for the Great Pyramid. Um, and so that would have been around the same time, uh, or the Great Pyramid would have preceded the, the Sphinx um, construction, probably. So that actually would have been George Reisner who was, who, was, who was stating that back in 1942. He was pointing out that the level of, of the... Of the uh, Cuesta, it is, um, was level with the top of the Sphinx head. And I looked at that volume, and that volume of rock that was quarried then would be roughly that, of uh, the same volume as the Great Pyramid. I, oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that one. Yeah. It's a rough calculation. I, it, when I did it, it came up slightly short, but I was like, yeah, this is, this is basically that. So where they got, he was an Egyptologist, you know, an archaeologist, where, where the rocks from the other pyramids came from exactly, I'm not familiar with. But I can tell you that that is roughly the volume of the Great Pyramid. Uh, some people are asking if I saw their earlier question. When I was talking to Bob before, I, was, I wasn't seeing all the questions. So ask it again if you want me to ask him a question about the Sphinx. Ask it again. Or if you have a new question about the Sphinx, uh, please uh, uh, send them on over in the chat here. Um, so let's see. Um, uh, what else we got here? Some of these are not about it. But... Um, were the blocks for the Sphinx quarried from nearby, or were they taken from expanding the enclosure itself? They were quarried nearby. They were that layer that the head was carved from. So they came from that basic area. They used the lower quality blocks, that, they, that, that soft layers, they used that to build the Sphinx temple and part of the valley temple. And they covered those, I believe, with granite. Mm-hmm. So you didn't see how poor quality they were. But the blocks that were put on the Sphinx, you, you needed high quali- they needed high-quality blocks so that they could carve it into the shape that they wanted. So that was quarried from that layer from which the head was, was see, carved. Yeah. Uh, when the Nile was closer to the Sphinx during the Old Kingdom, was the water table higher? Um, during the Old Kingdom, I mean, so this gets, somebody mentioned the Palermo Stone earlier. So it was actually a time of lower floods. So you ask the question, I mean, it's, it's, it's the obvious question is if today, if it weren't for the Aswan Dam, that the, occasionally the Sphinx and almost every flood, the, the, the valley and Sphinx temples would have been inundated. But during the Old Kingdom, there was a, it was a time of lower floods. Uh, so that explains. So that also helps put some brackets on when the Sphinx was carved, 
because you wouldn't carve it if it's going to be flooded every year. Yeah, and yeah. they didn't know it. Um, uh, Robin, I think that probably answered your question too. Um, and Gavin, we, we kind of already talked about uh, Robert Schock's theories uh, earlier. So uh, when we when you do the replay, go check that out. Um, I've heard that there's a second Sphinx. Uh, I don't know about that one. There are smaller ones uh, that you can pick up. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Um, there's there's people here that are arguing about I don't even know what. Have they found fossils within the Sphinx? Oh yeah. yeah I was mentioning Numulites gizehensius. <clears throat> so when you look at that fossil, it's an index fossil, and. Uh, there are geologists who can look at fossils like that, like like some people can look at a particular car and based on the color or the shape of the hood or something, they can pick out, they can discern the, that particular year. So Numulites gizehensius marks what's called shallow benthic zone 16. And so, the, and there's other fossils within the Sphinx too. And, 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 and so it's when that goes extinct that you get into shallow benthic zone 17, which is where the Middle Eocene climatic optimum occurs. And then I found some other fossils in the layer above that are also indicative of a particular time. So I bracketed that the, that the limestone in the head was deposited in a particular period based primarily on the fossils. Okay. Uh, I was wondering, uh, I think he kind of, you kind of answered this, but uh, someone says, I was wondering if the Sphinx was a geological anomaly within different stone in the quarry, or if they carved it by design. It was design. There's there's nothing unique. Um, the only thing, like I say, the, the size of the head was established by the size of a fracture-free block of, uh, of, of limestone. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you believe the Sphinx was built with the pyramids in mind or the other way around? Ah, that's an interesting <laughs> question. Um, I, I think that this, you know, Lehner and a lot of other people indicate that they think the Sphinx is sort of an afterthought, that the, that the pyramids were at least being made first and then kind of like somebody got this idea. I kind of lean towards that idea. I, I don't know if it was... But at the same time, it seems like they planned everything out. And and, and I'm not an Egyptologist, so I, I, I can't really answer that. But some people suggest it's, it's more of an afterthought. Um, what's the first written account on the Sphinx? Uh, I think that's from, not till the New Kingdom or something like that. Um, but uh, I'm going to do a video on the written evidence about the Sphinx. Um, so stay tuned for that. Is the Sphinx... So as far as I know, the, oh. the, the, the first mention is on the uh, Dream Stealer. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, took most of the fourth or something, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, is the Sphinx in a part of the floodplain that is or was fertile and farmed on? No. Okay. No, because it, it didn't have any soil beneath it. You've got the, the, the floor of the Sphinx excavation is, is carved and it's flat. Like I said, there's no plunge pools. So you couldn't grow anything on it, but not far in front of it at all would have been farmland. Okay. Um, what are your thoughts on claims that the Sphinx is oriented toward the rising of the constellation of Leo at certain moments? <clears throat> I mean, it's aligned east-west, so it's going to align with anything. Um, so the, that I don't see any significance in that. If you wanted to look at alignments and say, what does it say about when the Sphinx was made? Well, you've got, I already mentioned the, the Valley Temple and the Mortuary Temple, and there's a causeway that goes in between the two. And that causeway is not aligned east-west. Mm -hmm. So the south wall of the Sphinx excavation abuts up against the causeway. And that is a strong indication that the causeway was there before the Sphinx. Otherwise, that southern wall would also be aligned east-west, as, yeah. the, as the northern wall is, or as the western wall, north-south. Yeah, the causeway must come first. About, yeah. 
So yeah, so I mean, it's it's one of the basic principles of geology. You, you, you know, you can put these things together. W which happened first? Well, the causeway. It is based on everything I see. The causeway had to be there first, and it's the only explanation as to why that southern wall does not run east-west. Mm -hmm. But the Sphinx runs east-west, so it's going to align with anything. Yeah, yeah. How accepted or contested is Dr. Schneider's interpretation of the Sphinx site? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. You know, I, I was thinking, of, and that's a good question. I mean, this is just my interpretation i've looked at it and uh, this is what i'm seeing and i put it out there and for you and other people to look at to say does that make sense are, are you are I'm you seeing. are you going to plan on uh publishing it in a in a journal well so i kind of put off publishing because it just costs me money so but last year i, I was at the geological society of america meeting in portland and one of the geology professors, Clay Kelly at UW-Madison, came up to me and he said, I think you're right. And I didn't even recognize him. I said, Ab about what? And he goes, about the Miko being in the head of the Sphinx. I was like, oh my goodness. So I asked him if he wanted to co-author that. He's busy, but he said, yeah, it's a possibility. And I think that would we be great. Because yeah, so uh, th we then were... there's something official that can be referenced, you know? Exactly. And so... The uh, as we were talking, Susan O'Connell from Westland University, she asked, "Does National Geographic know about that?" And I said, "No. Are you with National Geographic?" And she said, "No, but I know people there." Uh, so I, I I need to get that published. Mm -hmm. The other thing I need to get published, and uh, maybe you're interested in being a co-author on it, is the construction of the the pyramid. I mean, of, of the Sphinx as a hybrid. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I might be interested. Sure. Because um, this is just cost. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, August, thank you so much for your super chat. Very appreciative. Uh, and his message is, no question, just wanted to thank you both for doing and making this kind of content and thank everyone for taking part in this channel. Shout out to the moderators for keeping it real. Um, Michael Schaefer, thank you for your super chat. The quarry left, he says, the quarry left the Sphinx behind that suggests there was plenty of material of desired quality, right? The quarry left the Sphinx behind. I'm, I, I'm not sure what that means. I don't um, either. That suggests there was plenty of material of the desired quality. Um, well, you can just look at that rock and it's not high quality. Just look at the sidewalls. Mm -hmm. It's only from the neck up, right? Um, so the neck up and, and then the, uh, the paws down. Oh, pause and, down. and the crazy thing is, is the, the rear pause. And the crazy thing is that that might actually be a second hyperthermal. Now, I'm, now I feel like I'm really crazy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> True Savage, I didn't deliberately uh, miss your question. I just happened to miss it. So say it again. If it's about the Sphinx, I'll, I'll ask it. Um, let's see. Is Are the remnants of the original quarry stone of the Sphinx still lying untouched below the current carved structure? And if so, how big is it? Uh, well, all of it's remnants of the original um, st stone, right? So uh, the, the Sphinx is carved directly from the, well, except for the blocks that covered it, the Sphinx was carved directly out of bedrock. So the the limestone beneath the Sphinx is just natural bedrock. Does, I don't understand the question. Yeah, I'm not sure about uh, uh, either. Uh, why do the Hittites have a Sphinx? Actually, uh, people all through this area, the, the whole eastern Mediterranean, even in Greece uh, and, 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 uh, and towards the uh, east as well, they all, the Sphinx was like a popular, there are variations, but a popular mythological figure. Um, where it was first invented, I, I don't know, but it, it's a common, common creature uh, in, in mythology around that area. So, David, I have a question for you. Okay. Um, it seems to me that all the Egyptian gods were human bodies with animal heads, and the Sphinx is the inverse. Yeah, an animal body with a human head. And, and as a geologist, I've looked at it, my reasoning is, as a geologist, you couldn't build one of those. You couldn't carve a person standing. It would be kind of hard, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you could never do that. But you could do the opposite. So I'm wondering if some... 
somebody just got this crazy idea. I said, well, let's invert it. Well, I don't know. I, I, my guess is that the Sphinx idea, the Sphinx concept already existed prior to the making of the Sphinx. Um, that, you know, it was already part of their 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 beliefs. They, they probably do drawing, did drawings of them, you know, or whatever. Um, and uh, And so they're like, well, why don't we do that? Because it's easier to make, <laughs> you know, or something like that. Or, but I'm sure there there may also have been a um, a religious reason for it. But it, but also it was nice because it was easier to make. Um, yeah. Uh, what is the main cause of the current salt buildup at the Sphinx, and is it at risk? Yeah. So the main cause is the wicking groundwater. And as the water evaporates, the salt is left behind. And yes, the Sphinx is at risk, and that's why they put in this uh, dewatering system. Uh, I've got a photo of Lindsey Graham with his thumbs up with a bunch of other uh, people from the U.S., other representatives, and um, because U.S. aid paid for this multi-million dollar dewatering system to protect the Sphinx. And they also drilled... Um, exactly where the Hall of Records is supposed to be. You can go online and find, you know, there's other people saying, well, they didn't do it at the right spot. And um, Mark Lehner is there, and he's actually logging it. He's doing a good job, and you can see how soft and weathered and buggy that that limestone is. Uh, What kind of tools did they use to carve it? Um, Well, I I guess that would be um, stone chisels and uh, copper chisels. Um, so they actually covered that, and that's what that's where I had the hardest time not being an archaeologist. I couldn't find any geologic process. There was n- at no point was there any process geologically that could create the surface that was on the Sphinx. And I kind of got frustrated again and went back and watched the Nova episode with Mark Lehner, and they were going to carve. I don't know if you ever saw this. They were going to carve a, a third size nose. They're going to carve a replacement nose. And they got this really high quality, almost a marble limestone rock, which would be the kind of thing that you'd want a sculptor to use. It wasn't the, the low quality rock or, you know, lower quality rock that, that the Sphinx actually is composed of. And they started creating it with stone tools. I mean, with, with yeah. So they just took two handed pounders and started pounding on on the on the sphinx and they also had rock hammers they gave up and had to eventually use power tools <laughs> it kind of defeats the purpose yeah so they're using too hard of a stone is what you're saying no no it's not that high oh. quality thing you know to carve yeah. a venus de milo or something right you just that limestone on the sphinx is pretty easy to carve right it's easier and so the details would have been carved with the chisels Okay, but so the so yeah, so the bigger getting rid of the bigger uh, parts would, would would have been more crude tools. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, let's see. I saw. Oh yeah, what is inside the Sphinx? Nothing. <laughs> there's yeah, I don't no think inside. So. I mean, there, are, I mean, there are a couple of um, entry points to go under. Like, there's a couple of holes, but I don't think they're that that large. Um, so I'm trying to remember the names of this. There's one that was drilled like in the 1800s. I can't think of the name. It begins with a V. Um, and that's just a, a boring. And they actually, uh, the the drill string, the, the, the cable tool got stuck in that for a while. And then there's that boring that I talked about at the back. And that looks like it's carved from the top down. And, and it would be odd because... If it were carved after the Sphinx was carved, then you wouldn't have marks from the top down. You could just open up at the rump and just start carving down. But it actually has marks that look like it started uh, higher and then worked its way down. Mm-hmm. And then there's the hole in the head. There's I don't know, and I don't know how deep that goes. And I I think the, the one in the head, and I would argue that the one in the back were test borings. Oh, okay. Does the water in the stone threaten the integrity of the bedrock in the surrounding area as well? That's a good question. No, I mean, because, you know, it's it's just going to create caves, the, you know, this acidic water and such. If there is anything else that, that I see that I'm sort of alarmed about, it's the fact that you've got this shallow water and it covers all the farmland in all of Egypt there. 
and the area is no longer flooded, so the salt that's accumulating in the Sphinx is also accumulating in the soil, mm -hmm. and it's no longer being flushed out, so it's only, in my opinion, a matter of time till all that farmland becomes useless because of salt. And it is, and the same process is happening on some of the mosques and things in the city of Cairo, where you can see this damage from the water wicking up. It's not unique to the Sphinx, where there's other structures that are, that are composed of limestone blocks, and they're exfoliating in exactly the same way that the Sphinx mm -hmm. does. How could the symmetry of the Sphinx face be so perfect with hand tools? Uh, I don't know how perfect it, I mean, it's symmetrical. Is it perfect? I think it's perfect enough that the Egyptians could have made it that way. Um, uh, would would the geological structure of the of the of the would the would the limestone that that particular limestone make it and the and the uh, the way it is formed there make it difficult to to make a symmetrical face? Well, it's not symmetrical because it follows the bedding plane. So if you if you look at it on one side, the bedding planes are coming down. I'm, ex I'm accentuating that, but they, they, they do come through there. Um, and proportionally, you can see how the artist played with the layers of the rock and used the rock, you know, took inspiration from the rock to, to carve that face. So I don't know if I'd call it perfect. It's, it was definitely inspired by a human face and then also, I mean, it's a human face, but inspired by the rock. Mm -hmm. Does limestone actually change hardness when exposed to the air? I think it does. That's not my area. I think it does. I think, I think if you take it, it's a good question. I, I, I think it does, but I'm not sure. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, we're, we're running out of time here, so I, 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 I'm going to try to pick out a couple more that uh, might be good. Um, uh, I think a lot of these have been answered already. Would the face have been painted? And could that have hidden the lines of the stone itself? Um, I think probably that's uh, it would have been painted. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. According to Mark Lehner, it was painted. And you can still see some of the paint um, by one of the years, if, if I remember that right. Um would they have patched over those layers? Yes, they, they, I'm sure they wouldn't have left it as the surface that you see now. But nonetheless, those layers were used to carve the proportions of the face. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, uh, we're running out of time, so I have, one, I have a question I want to ask you that's not related to this. But um, uh, So rumor has it, well, that's not rumor, you told me, but... <laughs> <laughs> that you challenged Randall Carlson to a debate, and he said yes, but now he's avoiding you. Is that true? <laughs> um, basically, yes. But he's the one who was on Uncharted X and said he was willing to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any geologist. So I wrote, to, I emailed Uncharted X and never heard anything. I then tried to contact um, Randall Carlson and also never heard anything. And one time I was watching a video and they were talking about their Southwest tour. So they were going to Utah and I'm looking at the photo in the background and I'm, I'm like, wait a minute, that's a San Juan end. Why? It's a place I've been going to for 42 years. I'm like, uh -huh. why is the San Juan Inn in, uh, <laughs> as a backdrop to find out that they were taking a tour that, that they, I think they had and now they were taking another tour and I was planning on going there. So I just modified my date. I mean, I might have been there on exactly that date. I just made sure that I was there. So they said they were going to meet at a point, at Muley Point, which if you've ever been, is just a spectacular viewpoint in Utah near Mexican Hat. They were a no-show. I don't know if they, they might have stopped earlier. There's a thing called Muley Point East. That is not the spectacular view, but what, whatever the case, they never showed up. So I was staying at the San Juan Inn, and they were at the hotel just to, elsewhere in town. If you've ever been to Mexican Hat, it's just a dot on the map. And so I went there, and I found them, and I you know, introduced myself and talked to Randall Carlson, and I said, you know, you're saying you're will, willing to go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, and uh, has anybody ever accepted that offer? And he said, no. And I said, well, I will. 
And we shook hands, and I gave him my card, and I've never heard from him. Interesting. <laughs> now, this was a this is a, a challenge to him on his uh, theories about the Scablands. Is that right? Oh no! I mean, he's 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 talking about all of this stuff. He's talking about the Sphinx, and we 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 did some uh, bar, you know, sparring back and forth. And I said, I am ready to discuss the Sphinx. I am ready to discuss Quebecly Tepe. I am not up to speed on the Scablands. He actually invited me to join him on the Scablands tour. He was going to do that fall. Of course, I never heard from him. But I said, I'm not up to speed on that. I am now. Mm-hmm. I, I went on a tour with the um, with uh, the Geological Society of America. They did a four day field trip with uh, Vic Baker, Richard Waite, um, uh, what's his name, uh, Brian Atwater. I mean, these are the names, and I, and so I, I learned all about it, and I, I can tell you exactly why the Scablands are. There's no evidence. Well, there's multiple floods, and they all occurred prior to 13,600 years ago. So it's not associated with the Younger Dryas. So Mm. Hancock and Randall Carlson and all that stuff, none of that makes any sense. There's no geologic evidence, and it was a particular layer. And and that layer was originally mapped as a silt, and now they realize it's an ash fall, and they could date it. And so that proves that all of the floods occurred prior to. So, <clears throat> so yeah. So now I've you know, but we sparred for a little bit, and then it was. It seemed like it would be fun. He seems like a nice person. I think Randall Carlson actually does, and I complimented him on this. He does a great job of describing geological processes, but then at the last minute, suddenly does this almost like creationist thing. You're like, where did that come from? So in a lot of ways, he's he's very accurate in what he describes. Mm-hmm. It's just weird hypotheses, conclusions out of it. So yeah, uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I don't know if I, if I can do anything to facilitate that, or if any one of you in the chat know yes. how to uh, get in touch with Randall, tell him that uh, Robert is ready and raring to go. We can get up, put uh, maybe set him up on the Modern Day Debates channel uh, here on YouTube. They do yeah. all kinds of debates. Um, so one of the things I wanted to point out, thanks for bringing this up, is I'm going to go out west again. I will be in Utah. I'm going whitewater rafting um, in, in, towards the middle end of June. And so I'm going to be in the area. I'm actually, I want to do a hike near uh, Muley Point. So I will be at Muley Point at 6 o'clock on Friday, June 17th. And I can explain the geology of that area, and there's almost there's nothing that catastrophic about it. It speaks of long periods of time, and it's a wonderful spot to really kind of grasp what's happening in the Four Corners area. So if anybody's around, I will be there. Oh, I'm so you're inviting people night. to show up if they want to? Yes, yes. Okay. Please show up. I'll be there. You know, I, I'm going to be there no matter what. So okay. show up, and I will explain. The geology of the area, and it's a wonderful spot because it starts with the Paradox Formation. I mean, so there's older rocks if you looked at the Grand Canyon and such, but it's a great place to start the story of the Grand Staircase and tell the whole story of of the Colorado Plateau. Mm -hmm. All right. Sounds great. All right. Well, thank you for coming, Bob, and talking with us today about the Sphinx, and uh, maybe we'll have you on again sometime to talk about Gobekli Tepe or something like that. Um, And and the Scablands. And the Scablands. (laughs) Um, it's kind of out of my area, but, uh, but it's, I'm sure a lot of my fans would be interested in it. Um, and thank you in the chat. Thank, uh, thanks to those who donated and thanks for just coming by and, and being part of this whole thing. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. We'll have another live stream coming up sometime soon. Um, and I wish you all a great day.